All righty, here we are. Welcome everybody to another installment of the Ask the Editor series. Um, I'm having so much fun with these and I'm so delighted today to welcome Marcella Sulak, Shulak, <laughs> uh, editor of the E, let's see if I get this correct, the Elon Notes Review, who is, um, Marcella is uh, joining us from the Czech Republic, though the magazine is based in Israel. Um, so how are you today, Marcella? Thank you. I'm doing great. Great. It is the end of our work day, five o'clock over here. Ah, yeah. yes. I was wondering what the time zone there was. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for spending your after work time with us. <laughs> um, so a little bit about the magazine. Um, the Ilanot Review is an international journal based in Israel, publishing a variety of poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and genres in between. They especially love translations and hybrid work. And their biannual themed editions are edited by alumni and faculty from the Shandy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing at Bar Ilan University and by guest editors. And Marcella Schulach is the author of three poetry collections, most recently uh, City of Sky Papers from Black Lawrence Press and the lyrical memoir Mouthful of Seeds. Her four translated collections of poetry from the Czech, French, and Hebrew have been awarded the NEA Translation Fellowship and long listed for the Penn Award for Poetry in Translation. She has co-edited the 2015 Rose Medal Press title, Family Resemblance, an anthology and exploration of eight hybrid literary genres, Associate Professor of Literature, Sulak coordinates the poetry track of the Shandy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing and hosts the TV One radio podcast, Israel in Translation. So again, thank you so much. Um, this is, it's great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Um, so Marcella, tell us, um, tell us about the Ilanote Review. Tell us the, the origin story. Um, were you one of the original founders? When was it founded? Uh, what in the world possessed you to want to start a literary magazine, um, and how did it all begin? Well, I came on after it had already been founded originally, and I, when I look on our archives, I see that they date from about 2009, 2010. The Shandy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing is, is dates from about, I think, 1990, well, it, it probably comes from a, it's probably 2003 was when the creative writing program started. And so the alumni quickly decided to create a journal for themselves. And I think originally for the first two years from 2009 to 2010, it, it came about to sort of publish um, the alumni from the program and colleagues, people who lived around, people who lived in Israel, people who taught at the university. And I came to direct the creative writing program in 2010, and I was asked to be the faculty advisor. And immediately, we, it was a happy marriage because on the one hand, I saw such potential for a journal that was poised in Israel. And the, the alumni were really doing pretty well and starting to make names for themselves and publish and they were kind of hungry for something more. And so we opened it up and originally we decided to open it up to anybody who lived in Israel and we started to make themes and in 2000 I guess things started in about 2011. I'm going to show you some of the themes as I talk because they sort of show you the um, they sort of show you the the history of our journal here. Okay. So these are archives, they're not digitalized here. But starting with Passing Through, we used Passing Through to introduce the idea that we would have people that didn't just live in Israel. At first we were thinking, well, they could live in Israel. By live, we mean they visited Israel. Hmm. By visited, we mean they wanted to visit Israel. <laughs> so basically our, our first was passing through and we decided, you know, it's cute and old fashioned. We decided that with passing through, we would have people that, that passed through. And then we found our groove with food because we're all foodies on this journal. Mm. I even have a community garden plot and I, we do organic gardening and, and Jane Medved, the poetry editor just, um, you know, 
cooks for 20 people per meal every Shabbat. I need to back up and say the, the alumni that founded this, Janice Weitzman, is a force of nature. She founded this journal and she was the managing editor until very recently. She went on to uh, found a different journal now that does that reviews books. So it's just a, a book review a journal and she does fantastic work. So that's Janice Weitzman. Um, Jane Medved was the original poetry editor and Karen Marone, the original Karen Marone and Nadia Jacobs were prose editors because back then there were just two poetry and prose. They're still on. Okay. I came in 2009 as the faculty editor, a faculty advisor, and then later I just became an editor because I couldn't, I couldn't stay away and advise. I had to get my hands dirty too. Um, Mitch Ginsburg also came on as poetry. Okay. So, I mean, I'm sorry, Mitch Ginsburg came on for fiction. Now, food, 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 sort of, we decided to just let our hair down and face it, we love food. <laughs> With translation and transformation, this was another very important uh, journal because with this one, we decided, I started to become an editor and we also decided to solicit artwork for our covers. And so they're really, they could become really beautiful and interesting. We had artwork also earlier. Um, but this one, with this, with this one, we reached to a really wide range of writers because we opened it up for translation. So we got incredibly well-known um, names like God, who did the Book of Job, and <laughs> Amelia Cohen Levy did this really crazy um, translation where she edited out God and only did Job, um, Job's. Um, translation. We had Cecilia Dropkin. Um, we had a lot of Israeli poets here. And then we had really great translators too, like Catherine Hellerstein. And were and these just um, submissions that came over the transom or were they solicited? or was These started to solicit. In the beginning, we solicited. Now, not all of them. Some of them came. Marty Newman just came in. Um, this came in. So we solicited half maybe and then half just came through mm -hmm. um so we we really so this was poetry was translation fiction focused on transformation and then nonfiction appeared here and we also did interviews um janice weitzman started to do the interviews at first but then anthony moreno started to create really crazy ones later on that became works of art in themselves. Mm. Um, with sentences, we decided to go hybrid. Um, sentences was prose poetry, basically. When we did, we started to play on strengths. It's Israel, so we did sacred words. It's the birthplace of three major religions. Um, we did conflict. Um, migrations, and then we decided to have a little fun because, you know, we got tired of women's this, women's that, as if women were the weirdos and men were normative, so we did the men issue. <laughs> so, um, with constraint, we went full on hybrid, and this is where we started actively soliciting hybrid works okay. uh, a lot. And this is... Uh huh. I need to find some of Anthony's. So one more thing that we did. Uh huh. I think this was in. Uh, so we some of our themes are based on on ideas and forms, and some of our themes are based on content. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hit or miss. Like sometimes things will work really well for poetry and not so well for fiction, mm -hmm. um, and vice versa. And when we did letters, I think if I can find it somewhere, um, sometimes it just happens that, you know, one of us had just read Amy Newman's letters to the editor mm -hmm. and we loved it so much. So we decided to do an epistolary one. This is when we started getting really crazy interviews. Um, and so, for example, Anthony, Michael Moreno is our favorite interviewer, but he can't always do it they actually mailed one another letters and the whole interview is epistolary like that. Oh, cool. It's beautiful. So I'm really proud of this. Yeah. 
one other thing that we wanted to do as we grew, and I have to say that editing this, it's wonderful. It's like being a toddler again, when every single day you learn how to do something new. It's so much fun. Every single issue we're growing and, and every single issue we try something else out. So one thing that um, we did decide about here, we were, we're doing pretty well with diversity just because of where we are. Um, but we really wanted to focus more on people of color that we wouldn't necessarily include, sometimes for political issues and sometimes for other issues. So we tried two things. We did a collaborative issue with translations from Granta Hebrew. And Granta Hebrew is a bit of a misnomer because some of their work is in Arabic as well. And this enabled us to get some really good Arabic language work from the region. Sometimes we just don't know how to solicit it. Sometimes it's not translated. And sometimes uh, for political reasons, people don't want to publish in the Illinois Review. So it really depends. Um, this issue allowed us to start reaching uh, audiences that we hadn't seen before. One other issue that we also wanted to include more women of color and so we started to solicit, um, you know, like all of my colleagues that I could think of. And I realized that African American women in academia are just overworked, and asking them to guest edit is not doing anybody any favors. So, what we decided to do instead was to start featuring their work rather than asking them to guest edit. We started doing, um, interviews with them about their new publications. And I think this is the one where Joy Katz um, interviews, yep, Joy Katz is interviewing Natasha Marin. So this really, this was something that we wanted to start doing more of. And our next issue, instead of doing the interview at all, we are doing micro reviews of five different books and to solicit a wider diversity we basically just read everything we can and we target people whose work we don't have that we want more of and so sometimes we will solicit for diversity because we think you know why overtax people that are already overtaxed it's it's our job to increase our own diversity so Sure. This is a great That's, interview. Yeah. Can you uh, talk about the conflict issue? I'm, I'm interested in that um, because I think people think about conflict when they think about that region of the world. I know. This is 2014. And so with this issue, what was going on here? This issue, we had... Uh -huh, we had various kinds of conflicts here. We did have some more poetry um, and we did have, but we decided to open it up. Living in Israel is often just like living in a cliche or a metaphor. Israel isn't always allowed to be Israel, a, a country where human beings live and, and love each other and do kind things and horrible things and make mistakes and, and have brilliant ideas. It's a country that is just laden with metaphor. And so in this issue, you're right. We, we decided to focus on all kinds of different kinds of conflicts. So Sabina Huynh has um, an essay to my grandmother. She is Vietnamese. Um, and so this is the, the Vietnam War. We've got Wadi, we have, this is, this is a very poignant piece about somebody who lives just on the border of, you know, beyond the Green Line in West Bank, but in a part of West Bank that had traditionally belonged to, um, had always been settled by Jews. So we, this isn't the, the West Bank you think of when you think of the, the settlers that are. Um, and then we have, Writing has nothing to do with love, Ethelbert Miller, right? So we have, we wanted to interpret, we always sort of let things come as they come in and we don't try to um, 
we don't really try to shape the journal when we come up with these themes. And so it was really nice to see what we, we got. Now, Asaf Gavron had been the interviewee for this one, and he has written a lot about, he's just written something called The Hilltop, and it's about an illegal settlement um, in West Bank. And he also has kind of funny stories um, almost Dead, which is also called Croc Attack, depending on if it was published in England. It's about a, this guy who magically escapes three suicide bombers. Um, and so he was our target for this conflict um, issue. And so we did focus it in Israel. We decided not to ignore the elephant in the room for that one. But we often find that sometimes themes that we think make sense for us, because we live in Israel, get completely interpreted differently by others. And I think that one of those issues was sacred words. We thought, oh, this is gonna be spiritual stuff. And you know, in Israel, you kind of can't help but live in a, in a, in a sacred kind of place, no matter how secular you are, your kid is still gonna get the Jewish holidays off. And you're still going to be um, looking at the ruins of the temple and you're still going to be, you know, so it's, it's everywhere. And so we found that our, the issue of sacred words was also interesting because when we, when we um, look at who submitted, the people that were from Israel basically kind of wrote about everyday life and we got other places like Liz Polliner's, this was nominated for the, the Pushcart Prize, and it actually was a finalist for that. This one is is about a separate time space, right? The Bishop's Garden. <laughs> so um, that's that's one thing that's really really interesting, and it's one thing that I really really love about editing an international journal is that it really does layer, or it does. We tend to, to, to idealize the world as like we're all one, we're all united. It's a global world now because of internet, and that's really not true. I mean, we do get to see each other, know each other, but our lived experiences are so, so different. And so one beautiful thing about this journal is that it puts these really different lived experiences um, in conversation. I loved... Akina Jai's Dias for Dictionary, for example. He grew up between Nigeria and London. And this is a gorgeous piece about this little boy who sneaks into the dictionary and tries to learn the dictionary. And it's wonderful. So you would never, you know, who would think that you would hide a dictionary from a child? This is these are things that I just love, these concepts and ideas and experiences that that meet on these pages. Yeah. Can you talk about you mentioned the artwork and I was really struck by the cover art of this most recent issue. It looks like it was actually just uploaded. Oh maybe it was yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, so, there it is. I really I like it so much and I it's so funny that the theme is delight because I was looking at it and I was thinking, oh, this could be like a horror theme too. <laughs> Just based on the artwork, um, it sort of has a kind of haunted quality. Um, but can you talk about how you choose your cover art and how you choose your artists? Yes. And, you know, while we're looking at this, I just have to say that this is a big shout out for Anthony Moreno. He is not even a Moreno. He's not even on our, he's not on our, um, He's not on our masthead, but he has done more editorial work for our journal than, than most of the editors, honestly. He's done so many of the book reviews and yeah. he, this, this cover looked pretty. Yeah. Um, and I don't think he'll mind us saying he's married to Karen Marone, who is one of the, who's the editor, um, production editor. And so it's very convenient because they live together and she's the production editor. Okay. So, um, the artist statement. So yeah, he was, this artist was shooting, the artist is um, Christopher Paul Brown. And how we choose our art is we have in our submittable categories, we've got cover art 
and just art in general. And then we have um, graphic. So store, you know, graphic arts, comics, you know, whatever. And it's kind of a big category. Sometimes our, our pieces that were submitted under a cover art tend to go inside sometimes and they create uh, like graphic essays. This one, we all loved it, but nobody thought that it could possibly be a cover art um, until, well, nobody, that's not true. I think it was Karen Marone who looked at it and thought it could be cover. And we, we, were, we weren't sure, but she made it work. So we just go in and we vote and we just pick out pieces of art that we love. We eliminate the ones we, we feel kind of mediocre about. And then we brainstorm, will this piece work as art as cover art or not? And it's not really a scientific way of doing it. It kind of just falls on the production editor who has the final say in the end, because sometimes pieces that we absolutely love just don't work as cover art. Um, he was shooting with the model, um, Katrin Dos, and he stumbled upon this warehouse. And that's what it is. His, his statement made it seem like it was lovely. The space was lit by indirect sunlight coming through the loading docks and sparsely placed skylights. Um, sometimes we really get seduced by this artist statement as well. Yeah. If, if he had presented this as it was a freaky, creepy place and everyone was scared, we wouldn't have picked it for the mm -hmm. delight. But it kind of, who doesn't want to put on a leopard's a leopard print dress and high tops and, and gold shoes and go into a warehouse. I mean, that looks fun. <laughs> so, it was not our first, it was not the most obvious pick though. And we debated lots of others. And so we just, we all liked it, but we didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, this cover was much more, um, <laughs> was much more that obvious. That like delight to me for sure. <laughs> so we started to do the front and the back cover uh, probably in 2016 because of because of a, a big argument that we had. Half of us loved one cover and half loved the other. And so we're like, well, let's just do them both. And so we introduced the, the front and back, which on a print journal means something, but on an, a, you know, an electronic journal, it, yeah. I think it just means that one is bigger than the other or you get to one first, I don't know. So this is Ricardo Gonzalez Roti. Yeah. Now we, yeah, none of us are trained um, artists. Mm -hmm. So even though we have their bios, it's kind of like reading them blind because mm -hmm. we don't often know what these mean, but it, it's really um, nice to find out that oftentimes, you know, you do, tend to select artwork that yeah. you know it's especially that, nice to see in an online magazine because i think in so many online magazines the art is sort of an afterthought or it's like a kind of stock photo to accompany a story or a poem but this looks like it's actually uh deliberately curated which is it's really nice to see mm -hmm. and you know we started doing this i guess uh, when we started doing hybrid mm -hmm. because we got some wonderful graphic pieces um, we, we sort of, you know, at this time, I have to say that the, the staff at the Illinois Review has been, they're very, they humor me a lot. And so I was working with Jacqueline Kolosov uh, with, with Rose Metal Press, and we were putting together an anthology of hybrid literature um, called Family Resemblance. And so I was going to a lot lot of conferences and just educating myself about graphic arts. You know, I love it. Who doesn't love reading comic books? But I didn't know that much about it. So one thing that happened is because I was doing that, I met Miriam Labitsky, who did some cover art, who did some graphic art for for an earlier um, an earlier issue. And then we started some of our work was solicited and then some like Lauren uh, Haldeman just fell into our laps and that was a couple of issues ago and it was just absolutely stunning. Katrina Roberts, we used to publish some of her straight poetry. She began doing graphic art and so now she'll just submit us, you know, 
-hmm. these lovely <laughs> Blood thrum, twinkle bun. These are just bizarre. They like combine manufactured <laughs> faux food with like <laughs> um, dark berry. And this was our favorite. We weren't sure what it was. It was very weird, but we all loved it. The uh, floats and self, or floats and self. Can you so, talk about, um, so this idea of hybrid work uh, is really interesting and I'm not sure all our viewers necessarily know what that means. So can you um, talk about what that means to you and sort of more of the sure. kind of work that you're seeking for the journal? Yeah, I will. And you know, sometimes we don't even put categories here when we are, because we just think, you know, it's art, art is art, but let me just look at maybe, so this kind of work can include, let me see if I can go to archives. This kind of work will include most commonly things like flash. Mm -hmm. So flash fiction just means very short stories. And in fact, in the next issue, we just published Delight last night. It went live last night. So this is wonderful timing. And we will start reading for the next issue called Ephemera or Ephemeral. It's going to have a parenthesis with an L in between. And um, Craig Santos Perez is going to be um, our guest poetry editor. And so that's a good example. Ephemeral art can be poetry that's written in the sand or poetry that's written on the frost of your window pane or something and you take a picture of it so that can be ephemeral but you can also just write about things that are ephemeral so it's a combination of more than one genre or it's something we like to think of genres as continuums so you can start off with a poem that has lines that in you know the lines end before the sentence does mm -hmm. so sometimes a poem will be in a block it's a prose poem like sabrina or a mark or um maybe i should just go to our to our hybrid issue our first hybrid issue in which we really wanted to focus on hybrid itself so this one we looked at, I'm just trying to see. So sometimes it could be a visual. Oh, wow. It can in include visual and poetry. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this sort of, you know, gets to the idea that originally, so these are all like, yeah, that originally language was all pictures anyway. You know, it was pictograph, the, the cuneiform and, and and they were symbols. So it could be visual work or sometimes it can be um, prose memoir. Let's see, this one looks kind of more like, it could be prose poetry or it could be a, um, a memoir that's told in verse. Um, it can be a lyric essay. So that could be an essay that kind of moves back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, between a straight narrative and just flashes of lyricness. Um, we don't really, it can really be some, that thing that you think, you know, is this, is this fiction or is this nonfiction? It kind of, you know, it's kind of true, but it's got made up parts. Mm -hmm. So any genre that doesn't neatly fit one thing or the other. Okay. For example, let me show you one more thing. This is Limericks. These, this is Shira Wolofsky. She's never published, um, to my knowledge, creative writing before. These are Limericks that are basically um, summarizing philosophy and other, you know, a rhetor addressing his flora, weaves the similes and metaphora, speaks a chiasmus cross, taking gain out of loss, and then claims to disclaim moxymora, right? So it's a lyric, it's a limerick, but it's mm -hmm. definitions. Yeah. Interesting. Um, would you characterize the journal as experimental in that 
way or is that um would you try to avoid that kind of classification i think all writing is experimental even traditional writing um traditional even if it's got a beginning a middle of the end and it's third told in third person narrative and you know a good story is going to be experimental because you're you're trying out new territory that being said we i think for this next issue have stopped taking traditional short stories we're only now going to look at flash i don't know if this is permanent but we're going to start doing that okay. um we we do love ourselves some regular traditional work and we often take work in received forms some of our favorite pieces have been sonnets and um and you know here's but but we also embrace everything in between so and what is your editorial process like will you um will you work with an author if something is almost there but not quite right or do do you not have the resources to do that at all and how what sort of happens behind the scenes it really depends on the piece mm -hmm. and it depends what genre mm -hmm. um for a while when janice weitzman was um she just left like last a couple of issues ago two issues ago so and when she was there she would she edited long fiction and she would work with the editor with the writers very closely and really really work hard on editing a, a piece if she liked it she you would edit it and get it it would get in and we stopped doing that because when we opened it to flash fiction we tended to get many more um, submissions than we had with the long fiction pieces and so we just didn't now with poetry um, I edit sometimes poetry, sometimes creative nonfiction. I go back and forth. Jane Medved and I go back and forth between them. And, and so if it happens that we get a really interesting piece from a writer that, for example, we really edited a Turkish poet last time because we had never had a Turkish poet submit to our journal before we liked the poem it looked like it had been translated from turkish it really looked like english was not the native language of the translator and so we worked we also did this with a greek um, poem about finance that was very interesting so if it is a if it if it's a translation especially we will work with the translator or the the writer um it did happen that we got a piece once from the Philippines by a very young writer and it was his first publication and he was our youngest writer we've ever published until this time and we we really loved the piece so much but it was but it just needed to it, it just tied up the package too neatly mm -hmm. and if he just left out the last you know, couplet, mm -hmm. boom. And so we helped him with that. Um, sometimes we see pieces that, that we really, really love and that they do need editing and we, we don't want to take it as is because we have so many other wonderful pieces that we want to include. So we often, not often, probably five pieces a time, if we really love something, we might suggest edits. Okay. And usually these are taken, you know, in the spirit in which they're meant, because honestly, it's a huge act of generosity and esteem mm -hmm. to offer edits mm -hmm. to somebody's piece rather than to just, you know, um, rejected and so one time I think somebody got their feelings hurt you know like oh you should just take it or leave it and, and you know it, it feels but most of the time you know we start off with saying this is just one person's opinion and as a human being who's also an editor mm -hmm. this one paragraph stopped me from falling in love with this piece you might consider 
yeah. in the future taking it out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's great when that happens. Unfortunately, um, so many editors talk about it backfiring <laughs> and writers being very angry to receive feedback. So, uh, but I, I think any any writer that gets feedback on their work should be um, take it in, in good spirits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? We've always had really positive, um, very positive, except for one time, we've had very positive reactions to that. And I honestly think it's because Karen Marone does it most of the time for nonfiction and she's so diplomatic and delightful that you know you should all submit to the nonfiction first of all because we don't get that much and second of all it's just delight <laughs> we're all delightful to work with but karen marone is particularly delightful to work with here. is that something that you your magazine actively seeks more of is nonfiction? we yeah you know what we could use some some and i know that we're not unique here like everybody says that nonfiction is the genre that we get the least of mm. and consequently we only publish one or two pieces a shot but if we got as much as you know we easily get 10 percent of what everyone else gets you know what fiction and poetry get mm. so if we had as much as fiction and poetry would probably publish more but right now we usually publish two three pieces of of nonfiction that we absolutely love mm -hmm. this time around we got um, we got a beautiful, beautiful piece by a former student, Hassan Haj Haya, who studied engineering and then went on to study literature. And he wrote very, very um, sincerely about what it's like to grow up in in, in Israel as an Arab Israeli. Mm. And it was wonderful and and beautiful and we did help we did edit this piece a bit mm -hmm. and um so this is this is an example of the kind of nonfiction that we absolutely love it's a personal story it's it's he's telling his life through the literature that he's reading he's as well as through the stories that his parents tell him and through history so this is a beautiful and it's sincere. It doesn't really care that much about politics, although he's in a very unique, he's in a unique place. Um, he's, there's a scene in which he's in, you know, studying with in this leftist movement. And sometimes some of the things that some of the leftist students say are just ridiculous, you know, like, so he's, he's very, he's very open and very honest. And it's so wonderful to get something like that. Mm -hmm. The other piece that we got, now keep in mind that this is the this is the, um, oh wait, this is a different issue. Yeah, delight. The case for cliche was was a, another piece that I absolutely loved. Um, and this, this is Stephanie Sauer and just writing about, you know, ideas that we never think of, like cliche. We always think that cliche is bad. So I love this essay because it's fanciful, it's, it's smart. And it also takes us an idea that we don't usually think of and, and flips it over. Mm -hmm. So it's I love it. There was once a woman who scraped the language off the lungs of the dead and mixed into it a pole. I, we love surprising turns of phrase. So yeah. That's great. Um, it seems like you guys get a lot of international submissions. Is that true? We get, you know, a lot of these are also American and we are getting more and more international. I think this one is Nigeria. Um, we, American, <laughs> we just, she read, uh, Janine Serta read last night, so you can, you can hear this on our, our launch that's on our web page. We have a Facebook page um, for Illinois to review and then we've got the, you can hear her. Um, but yeah, we do get a lot of international. Mm -hmm. Probably it's half from the United States and half international, do depending. You people make assumptions about the magazine because it's based in Israel and send you work that you just, it's like totally, I guess that happens at all magazines where it's just like, this is not what we publish and uh, <laughs> this is not what we're interested in. Oh, if we ever get pieces like that? Yeah. Yeah, basically, we don't like to publish um, pieces that have already decided the meaning of life or the resolution of all conflict or 
We also don't, you know, we're based in Israel, but among our staff, we have a variety of political beliefs mm -hmm. and a variety of lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And so we also don't cater to any particular form of religion or secularism or anything like that. So I guess, yeah, the pieces that we just will just, you know, not even show any interest in are pieces that have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is there work that you you hope to see more of? Are there things that you would just like really like to see for an upcoming issue? I guess we um, more nonfiction, <laughs> mm -hmm. more nonfiction, and you know I'm so happy with what we've been getting recently. Aside from more nonfiction, and I'm really excited to see what happens with ephemera. Um, I'm really excited about Craig Santos Perez um, guest editing. That being said, we loved Julia Bausma's guest editing <laughs> this past time. She was really lovely to work with and, and had such good ideas and, and very conscientious. So we, I guess what I'm kind of expecting with this next issue and what I'd love to see for the ephemeral is is maybe some experimental work with thinking about literature, art, poetry in ways that you haven't thought of before. Um, where can art be seen? Um, you know, can you create literature from from natural objects around you? Can you um, can you perform literature in places that it usually isn't performed? A McDonald's or a shoe store or, you know, like, <laughs> um, so I guess the ephemeral is going to open up new things that I haven't even imagined, but yes, we are hoping for some more visual experimentation. And then I'm thinking that ephemeral also is going to be an interesting theme for us coming out of COVID lockdowns, mm -hmm. because it's also if you focus not on the form, but on the content, mm -hmm. you know, the transience of life, mm -hmm. um, the preciousness of life on earth right now, um, when, when we all have survived or those of us who have survived have survived, those of us who have not, we're mourning them. We're thinking about our planet that seems to be in grave danger right now and the recovery, the brief respite that it had um, while we were all indoors and we couldn't work in factories. Mm -hmm. So, or buy things. I don't know. I think we just want to be surprised. Mm -hmm. Really, what we really are looking for is just something we've not seen before. And it's hard to describe that if you haven't seen it before. Mm -hmm. um, we also like things that, you know, we have seen before because everybody, you still keep falling in love. You still keep having children. You still keep making food and growing it. <laughs> so just these things, this daily life, but if you can say it in, in your own special, unique way, in a new way, if you really pay attention to how you're speaking and writing mm -hmm. and being in this world, it's just mindfulness, I think, that we, mm -hmm. we like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, this is what all journals like, really, you know, mm -hmm. good writing. Yeah. yeah, it's a really interesting theme, especially right now, this idea of things that you thought were permanent becoming ephemeral and the, the good qualities of ephemerality and also the kind of instability that um, has been created for yeah. all of us. Yeah, and you know, this is also, I guess, this may be also why we wrote it. Do we have this up yet? No, we don't have it up. Okay, it's coming up. Mm -hmm. We have our, yeah. We wrote ephemeral like this because we were thinking ephemera might be better for poetry. It might focus on these things that are leaving, but ephemeral, we wanted to capture both this idea that there were things that we thought would last forever and they don't. Um, and there are things we always knew were not meant to survive, and yet they do. And so that contradiction that's built into this idea yeah. is, is interesting, yeah. That's great. Can you actually scroll up again so people can see, um, because you have an upcoming reading period very soon, 
Um, so people we do. And here's one more thing. We recently started to have, we, 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 especially with COVID, we started charging a reading fee because we used to, we used to really scramble hard for that to make up that submittable fee. We would have bake sales. We would bring people, you know, we would babysit and, you know, we would donate our books. We would donate our time. So we finally, we couldn't do any of that during lockdown. So we started to have um, submission, submission um, fees. We do still pay attention to the fact that many people can't afford it and it's a burden. And so we do have free submissions the first two weeks of our two month mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, period. So free submissions are May 1st through 14th. And if you need it, do, you know, use this time. If you can pay for them, then we appreciate it if you wait till you can, but nobody's judging you. <laughs> do what you want. Um, paid submissions then will be May 15th through June 30th. And, you know, as always, if this is, if you, you know, if you can't afford the $3 fee, then just talk to us. But yeah. What, what is the turnaround time between acceptance and when that issue goes live? We're pretty fast. Okay. Um, and the reason we're pretty fast is that we, we, we just, I don't know. We, we are all type A personalities and we just can't stand up. <laughs> Things on our plate and you know we're so busy we a lot of us have toddlers some of us have you know one of us has grand toddlers <laughs> and so we only have we have quick spurts of time so we'll jump on and then we'll just read I like I personally like to go online and look at everything you know two or three times a week mm -hmm. so it depends who the co-editors are, but they could be as short as one week oh, wow. and uh, the longest it's ever taken, but it's usually longer than that, but it never takes longer than, than if it takes, if it takes three months, that means we're arm wrestling over your piece. <laughs> um, so usually it's like more like a month. Okay. If it takes a long time, we are, yeah. It's, it's a period that is, is, yeah. Uh, how, so this issue will go live in the fall or in the winter? Yeah, this, we try to do them every six months so that we can um, have them up mm -hmm. so that they get some love. Mm -hmm. So this one is, we're closing it. So our current one just went live yesterday. So six months from today, from yesterday, we'll okay. put up the next one. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody wanted to get more involved behind the scenes with your magazine, do you ever work with volunteer readers? Um, or is there any kind of um, opportunity? You know, we're, we're so small right now that we don't, we did have an intern, um, but we don't really at this point, at this time, mm -hmm. have have outside readers i guess if if we had you know there are, we karen has already mastered production but i guess the main we i didn't even talk about this with my staff so i don't want to say anything but i guess if somebody's really good with doing um with doing more of the work of production that might be something that we would look for but that's not at literary so yeah sure uh well this has been really great our our time is just about up but i i'm so excited to learn more about this magazine and it really i have to say it's so evident how much you love <laughs> this journal i mean the fact that you can just sort of sum up any issue in the archives and you know which author did what um it really, <laughs> really shines through that you have um, an incredible devotion to this magazine so i i think it's been really great to learn about it and to learn what you're what you're up to and to learn more about the genre too like um the visual poetry and uh the idea of sort of photographing a poem that you wrote in fog <laughs> on your window yeah. really cool um so it's just it's been great to learn about this magazine thank you so much here i'll stop my share so we can <laughs> um, thank you i have to say that one thing <laughs> this is the nice thing about it being a small staff Mm -hmm. that we all can play. If somebody really is, is fascinated about something and we want to explore it, we just 
go for it. We yeah. can do that. Mm -hmm. um, because we just, we have, you know, how many of us are there? There are three fiction and then three that rotate between, we, we call it lies and truth, where there are three nonfiction poets and there are three fiction mm -hmm. <laughs> editors. So we can kind of do what we want. Mm -hmm. um, Great. And, and yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And we kind of have all grown up yeah. in various ways through the... Sounds great. It sounds like a little community and um, mm -hmm. like you're learning a lot and getting a lot out of editing. Yeah. Um, really and, you know, I have to also say that we've reached a point, you know, in the beginning we were hustling pretty hard to get some submissions, but now we've reached a point where we, we just publish what we love because we do get a lot of submissions and we probably publish 2% of the submissions we get now. Um, so it's a wonderful place to be. And, and it's, uh, Maybe it's more nonfiction. It's probably ten percent, or okay. you know, or fifteen. So submit a yeah, sure. higher chance there. But yeah, it and depends on the issue. Um, any the final words for writers that you might have? If if somebody submits to you but they don't get accepted, should they keep trying? Um, how definitive is a rejection? Um, we um. If a writer is, is a serious writer and are, is really dedicated to the craft, a rejection doesn't mean don't ever submit. It could just mean that it wasn't on theme. We do send out, we do send a different kind of, of decline letter for people that have made it into the final round of discussion. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, it might just mean that that two people loved it and one person just hated it and said, if you publish this, I'm quitting, you know, <laughs> not, not. But, you know, you never know. So occasionally it could just be taste. You know, somebody's dog just died and you and you have a piece about a dog dying, you know, maybe it's just bad timing. So I would say that if you're a serious writer and you're really working hard and you've read the journal and you think that it's a good fit, submit again, it, you know. Any other final statements? <laughs> no, I guess the main thing is just read, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. You can always tell people that read and love reading and love and, and keep up with what's happening, have a sense of self irony and, and just know, have a sense of themselves in relationship to the literary and physical world that they live in. Even if they live in their heads a lot of the time, it's just nice to get work from, people and writers like that so and I guess the final thing is you know if you are so lucky that the editors have given you any feedback at all even if you don't agree with it not just from us know that this is an act of generosity like nobody becomes an editor as an ego trip it's a lot of hard work and you never get mentioned so it's done out of love of what you're writing so I guess that's the Absolutely. thing Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been oh. really illuminating. Thank you. I'm so happy to be on this part of the series. I absolutely love what you do in the Lit Mag Roundup. And <laughs> and before that, the review review, review has just, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I learned so much from reading all, all yeah, of that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marcella. Um, Thanks. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.